Well, hello, everyone. I hope you're having a, uh, a good Thursday. I know I am. And welcome to this webinar. I am really uh, honored that so many of you uh, have decided to join us today. We, we have um, 30, 31 people kind of fluctuating here. We had uh, like 54 people sign up. However, you know, there's always some that are not going to be able to make it for some reason. So that's cool. I'm glad uh, we have who we have here today. And uh, Irina, you uh, just put in a message there to greet me. Uh, hello back to you. And this gives me kind of an opportunity uh, and is a great reminder for me to to mention to you that if you have any questions or if you're having uh, any problems during the webinar, just pop something there into the chat room or the chat uh, window and I'll see it. Um, now, Irina asked if we're going to record it. Uh, yes, we are. We're recording it right now. I should be able to have the recording posted in mm, maybe about two hours uh, after we end today. I'm also going to have the slides uh, posted as well. So um, you'll be able to have access to them. I I was thinking about trying to make them available to you a little bit sooner. Uh, so that you'd have something to follow along with, but I just wasn't able to quite do that. I was actually adding a few things even right up to the time uh, that we started here. Uh, <laughs> kind of the way I am. Uh, it drives some of the conference organizers crazy uh, when I do things like that. But I, I sometimes think of stuff, and I just have to, I just have to put it in there. Now, uh, hopefully, you guys can hear me okay. Uh, if you can't. Uh, of course, I don't know. If you can't hear me, you can't put anything in the window. Uh, but uh, if someone can put a, a confirmation that you are hearing me, that's good. Um, I see a lot of people that I recognize. Um, Aaron, Barb, Beth, Jill, thank you. Uh, Catherine, hey, I haven't heard from you in a long time up in Canada there. Uh, thank you. Chris, right here in OKC. Thank you, buddy. Cynthia, yep, yeah, okay, awesome. And then some people are just kind of uh, entered as callers from a phone number. Carlos, uh, hello. Uh, Chris Spears from up in Ohio, uh, hi, good to have you with us. And I think some of your team as well. Um, uh, Darko, Diane, Drew, Esther, Irina, as I already mentioned, Jennifer, Kim Bradshaw, Lisa, Michelle. Ricky, Robin, Rose, good to have you, Rose. Um, and I'm sorry, uh, uh, CT, I think. I'm sorry. Sometimes I have trouble with, with some names, okay? And uh, that may be one of them. Okay, uh, my, totally my fault, okay? So uh, let's get right down to it. Uh, I'm going to go from the camera mode here into the slideshow mode. Once again, thank you very much for being here. I'm going to uh, always be looking into the chat window to see uh, if any questions are popping uh, in. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> they say, no problem. Everyone has issues with my name. Uh, I have issues with my name, too. You know, uh, some people call me Randy Price, Randy Wright, Randy whatever, you know, Reese, Weiss, you name it. So um, anyway, uh, thank you for being here. I'm going to get into the topic. I'm also, as I said, going to be checking the chat window for any questions. I know we may be getting into some topics that at times may be a little bit uh, confusing. I hope they're not. I'm trying to make this as explainable as I can. But just at the outset, I'll just say that I know a lot of people kind of struggle with how to actually write a decision table, how to create it. And for those that are maybe preparing to take uh, an ISTQB foundation level or advanced level exam, uh, decision tables are part of those certification exams. And you only have just a certain short amount of time to complete it. And so I'm going to tackle uh, this fairly I consider fairly involved sample question that's on the current ASTQB sample exam and kind of walk you through that as how I would approach solving it. And in fact, thinking back on what I did the first time that I saw the question. Because as a trainer, 
uh, for ISTQB certification and ASTQB certification, uh, I don't see the questions. I'm not allowed to see the questions. And so I'm kind of left with the same uh, resources as you are, the sample exams and, and things like that. So anyway, uh, I'm going to share my desktop here. Um, I hope it's not too cluttered as we get started. Um, and we will get going because we have quite a And I'm going to turn my webcam off for just a minute so we can have a larger area. There we go. OK. So as you can see, I have quite a few things on the agenda here. I'm just going to kind of walk through uh, the process, basically, of decision tables, how to create them, how they can help you, some of the nuances around the decision tables. And I've purposefully saved the uh, sample question until the end because I realize not everyone might be interested in hearing that explained. However, if you have the time, I would encourage you to hang around because it is a pretty good example of what we're talking about in decision tables. Now, decision tables, you know, some people kind of equate them with decision trees, and in a way they are related, but uh, in another way, they're really, really different. Uh, the, the big thing about decision tables are that you can use them for multiple purposes. You can capture requirements uh, with them. Uh, you can hash out requirements and find gaps, perhaps. And also, you can take that to functional definitions uh, that uh, you may be using for your testing and for building the system. So uh, one of the things that people often complain about uh, in, in testing and in systems development and, and, and all that is uh, classically that they don't have a lot of uh, good specifications to work from. And even if they do have those, many times they do have gaps and problems in, in those. So uh, one of the great things about decision tables are that you can start off with just a very, very partial specification. As long as you know one of the main processing rules, then you can flesh them out uh, to, to be more complete. We'll talk more about that. Especially helpful when you have rules that have a degree of complexity to them. Because I don't know if you've experienced this like I have, but sometimes people who write requirements or some specifications do not consider simplicity <laughs> in how they write them. And sometimes you have to read something like 10 times before you can actually kind of unwrap what they're saying. And, and decision tables help you unpack the various conditions and then kind of hash them out into identifiable rules that you can test. Something that's interesting and I think there's kind of a, a crossover here that doesn't get mentioned in the foundation level syllabus for the ISTQB is that decision tables uh, or decision tables can also be a part of white box test design, structural test design. And we may not think of it that way very often, but I'm going to show you an example of how you can apply decision tables uh, to white box testing. And so to kind of summarize, I got a bit ahead of myself here, but the, the key point is, is that you really do not need the complete definition of a requirement to use or to create a decision table. In fact, that's the big value of it, uh, that you give me one rule and then I can deduce the rest. And that's the big benefit for not only testing, but requirements analysis is that it helps you identify those conditions and combinations of conditions that you may not have thought of yet, or maybe your stakeholders haven't thought of to tell you if you're a business analyst. So at its core, decision table testing is what is also known as logic-based testing from a functional perspective. And anytime that you have uh, a situation where you have logical determinations of things. Uh, you know, if this happens and this happens and you do something kind of thing like that, then decision tables are probably a good fit. I think back in my uh, early testing experience when I was uh, testing medical laboratory software, a lot of the instrumentation that we would test 
would be highly based in logical Boolean kind of conditions. And I'll never forget, you know, this was really kind of my initial baptism into testing where I worked out all the possible combinations and, and being a math major, you know, I have a natural interest to this anyway. And when I saw that it was over a million combinations, I thought, oh, my goodness, you know, how, how are we going to do this? And fortunately, I stumbled across cause effect graphing. I stumbled across decision tables and it really did help. But let me give you a word of warning, as it says on the slide here, your best way to apply this is kind of on a smaller scale. The more rules you have, the larger your table can possibly be. In fact, the, the way to know how big the maximum size of a table would be is you take the number of conditions that you have and then two to that number. OK, so two to the nth power where n is the number of conditions. So uh, as it says here on the slide, if you have seven rules, it's 128. Eight rules will give you 256 cases, which would basically be 256 columns on a spreadsheet. OK, and that's just with eight uh, different rules, eight different conditions that you'd be testing. So as you can see, it gets really big in a hurry. Now, at its core, each rule can be seen as being either true or false. Sometimes people express them as yes or no, sometimes even zero and one. But there's also a third possibility, and that is you could have an invalid or an illogical uh, uh, condition. Uh, for, and, and I'll show you so show you why that would be the case. Now, that does not mean that we're not that we're no longer dealing with binary conditions. We're still dealing with a binary type of analysis. So it's not like three to the nth power or anything. It's still a basic, simple, true, false determination that we're making. OK, one of the most common things that I hear from people is, can you just start simple? <laughs> so, OK, I'm going to do my best, but you'll see in this example that it can get even complex a little bit with a simple example. So I'm going to start out with a payroll rule that if, it, if an employee is hourly and they work over 40 hours in a weekly pay period, they're paid overtime for every hour they work over 40 hours. The overtime pay is 1.5 times the regular hourly pay. So the first thing you do is you define the conditions. In this case, we have two. One is that the employee is hourly and the other is that they've worked over 40 hours in a week. And from that, then, you can define the true or false or yes or no, depending upon how you're doing that, uh, values for each of these. Now, a little helpful hint here is to start with rule one and make that your happy path. OK, so we're going to say, yes, the employee is hourly. Yes, they've worked over 40 hours in a week. Uh, and then we'll come back to the actions in just a minute. OK, so the second rule then we're going to keep the employee being hourly, but now we're going to say they haven't worked over 40 hours in a week. OK, so that becomes false. Now, that pretty much makes sense, uh, I think, to most people. If it doesn't make sense to you, I'm going to check the chat window in a second and you can let me know. Now, the third rule uh, we're going to now, since we've looked at both possibilities for the hourly condition, we're going to make the hourly condition false. So let's say the employee is salaried and we could say they have not worked over 40 hours in a week. And rule four is we're going to say the employee is salaried and they have worked over 40 hours in a week. So in those four rules, you see all the possible true false outcomes. OK, and basically each rule, each column there would be the equivalent of a test case. Now, the third thing we do is we define what the outcomes will be or the actions, as I'm saying here. So in rule one, with hourly and over 40 hours, they get overtime pay, which is one and a half times their hourly pay for every hour worked over 40. Rule two, they get no overtime pay because they did not work over 40 hours. Rule three, same thing, no overtime because they're salaried. And rule four, 
no overtime because they're salaried. Now, if um, you notice that in rules uh, two, three, and four, all the outcomes are the same there. Uh, no overtime are, will be paid. But if you look in rules three and four, you've probably already thought about this as you've been listening to me explain this. We really don't care when the employee is hourly if they've worked 40 hours or not. So what I would tend to do there is make that an I or some people just leave it blank. Now, I kind of prefer to put an I there so that I will know that I've actually considered the, the uh, condition. Now, an interesting thing happens uh, at this point. Um, you'll see here that uh, you know we can consider this uh, these invalid conditions. And if we look at now what we have for rules three and four, you will see that those two rules are exactly identical. You know, we have false I and true and false I and true. So we wouldn't want to have two test cases that were totally redundant at that point. So basically, we only need three rules or test cases to get what you would consider to be full decision table coverage. Now, this is called a reconciled table. And it's called reconciled because you've addressed the uh, illogical or the maybe uh, impossible or whatever invalid conditions that would be there. Now, there, there is a consideration uh, to think about here, and that is if you're really trying to do a rigorous test and you want to like make, let's say the employee is salaried and you want to try uh, to put in over 40 hours a week for them, you can, okay, as a negative test. And likewise, they may not be hourly and they may have under 40 hours and you just you may want to test just in case. OK, so these would be considered a negative test. They they expand. They make your table bigger and they're going to take they're going to add more time to your test. Uh, so you won't be gaining any efficiencies there, but you may feel that the risk is such uh, or maybe this is the first time you've tested it or something that tested the software that you want to consider. Uh, all the true false possibilities. So that that is a possibility that you may want to consider. Now I'm going to take a quick pop over here to the uh, to the chat window and uh, see if there's any questions at this point. Uh, I don't know. Does, is everyone doing okay? You don't have to all chime in here, but uh, if anyone has a question, uh, just pop it in there, and I will be happy to address that. I'm going to give you just a second if you have a question. That also gives me a chance to um, get a sip of coffee here, too. OK. Very good. Well, let's proceed. So as I said, when we reduce the table, what we're doing is we're getting more efficiency in our test design. We have fewer cases with no loss in the condition coverage, assuming, now there is an assumption there, assuming that the, uh, th that the rules are being followed and that they're being implemented correctly. And now we know as testers though, that doesn't always happen, right? That's why we test. So uh, as, as I said, the, the, the risk may be high enough that you may want to do a more complete coverage. And so you may want to not hash out the invalids. It actually makes things a lot easier on the design side. It just gives you more things to test. But I will add that as we're going to see a little bit later when we look at the white box view of this, there are truly times where there will be situations that the, the certain combinations of conditions are impossible to test. The example that I give here on the slide is, let's say that you are testing certain types of browsers and certain types of operating systems. Well, if a condition was true that you were testing the Internet Explorer browser and the operating system was also true that you were on a Mac operating system, there would be no way you'd even be able to construct the test because uh, unless you're using a virtual environment and that's not what we're talking about here. Okay. 
So um, there are truly uh, invalid and illogical combinations of conditions that you, you may want to consider. Uh, you'll know those, by the way, when you start playing around with this kind of test design and, and when you start seeing the conditions just don't work with each other and they never can, you can't even test them, you'll, you'll know when those situations exist. Now, let's go to a little bit more uh, complexity. Uh, let's extend our rule a little bit and say that, okay, we're hourly, we've worked over 40 hours in a pay period, we don't have any kind of leave that uh, is in excess of our overtime, no sick time, vacation, or holiday, holidays, and we've also not worked any holidays during the week. Then we compute our pay at 40 at the regular pay rate, 40 hours for, or I'm sorry, for every hour over 40, we get overtime, which is one and a half times the regular rate. Now, we don't really address what the uh, holiday pay is here, but we'll get to that. So I'm not going to do all the fancy animation that I had in the previous slides here, but you'll see I did, I did the very same thing. I started out with my conditions, and, and there are four of them this time. Uh, the employees hourly, they've worked over 40 hours in a pay period. Their sick time is less or any kind of leave is less than their overtime and they've worked no holidays. So you see rule one, all of these conditions are true, the happy path. And this is our action that we stated in rule one. Okay. Now rule two is just simply a variation of rule one concerning holidays. In this case, we're saying, yes, we have worked holidays during the week, and we've also worked overtime, and our sick leave has not taken away from our overtime, and we are hourly. In this case, not only do I get paid overtime, but I also get paid holiday pay. I know some of you who are, sour, who are salaried are thinking, man, I need to go back to hourly, right? <laughs> I know. Uh, so anyway, uh, then in, in rule three, well, you can tr you can try being a consultant. I don't get overtime or hour or holiday pay, <laughs> but that's just a side joke there. Okay, so rule three. Now we're going to toggle the uh, the sick time and vacation and holiday part of this uh, rule the, that condition, and we're going to say yes, we have taken leave in excess of our overtime hours. Now I know it sounds like a raw deal, but uh, that's actually a fairly common rule that a lot of companies have, um, so you, that you can't have overtime and have offsetting uh, leave time in the same period. So we're hourly, we worked over 40 hours, but we have taken vacation or holiday or leave in excess of our overtime. Now at this point, uh, it doesn't matter about holidays as far as we're concerned in this view of the table. No overtime is applied or no overtime pay rate is applied. And then condition, or I'm sorry, rule four, we're going to toggle this uh, rule for the hours worked over 40. We're just going to say, no, we have not worked over 40 hours. Then we don't care about the leave. We don't care about the holidays. We get no overtime. Now, in this example, all the uh, values for hourly are true. All we have to do, if we added one more rule out here, I haven't done it, but if you just imagine rule five being our, uh, the employee is false, as, as hourly as being false, then we don't care about worked over 40 hours. We don't care about the leave. So everything kind of becomes I and then no overtime. So it actually, in this example, if with a reconciled table, we would have five possible rules. Now, just to kind of contrast this with all combinations, we have four conditions, right? So if we were to do all true false values, not doing any illogicals or, or invalids, just saying I'm going to test all true false conditions, then it would be two to the fourth power, or we would have 16 possible rule combinations out here. So that would be how that would work out if you did complete combination coverage. So the, the big thing about decision tables for test case design is they help you identify the logical variations that many times you just do not see in the requirements or in the use cases. The, uh, the specifications are very good many times at telling you a basic rule or maybe a few basic rules, but they hardly ever tell all the variations because that would be far too tedious 
uh, to capture and it would make the requirements very, very uh, large to do that. But they can also, these decision tables can also identify maybe combinations that you might not want to test or might not be possible to test. And so therefore, it kind of gives you this more compact set of cases. Like with the um, medical testing lab example that I was saying earlier, there were um, quite a few conditions that we were able to hash out and eliminate. And we got our overall uh, number of tests down into the range more like around 500 as opposed to a million. Uh, it was a combination of cause effect graphing with decision tables. Uh, but that's decision tables are eventually where you wind up when you do uh, a technique uh, like cause effect graphing, which is just a visual way of displaying much of what we're talking about here. And also they help you determine how much of your uh, test case design uh, is done. Because if you take a basic rule and start writing a decision table and you've only created like two of those rules in test cases and you have eight or 16 or whatever, that tells you how much further you have uh, left to go in your test case design. Now, this is uh, just about a verbatim quote from the ISTQB Foundation level syllabus, uh, and that is about coverage standards. With, with a decision table, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the coverage standard is basically one test per column, and um, that is typically involving all combinations of triggering conditions. Uh, however, in some cases, though, uh, for impossible conditions, uh, it may be actually less than all true-false uh, conditions in there. Now, before I venture into the white box territory, I'm going to go back over here to the chat window for just a second to see if we have any questions. And it looks like we're doing okay. Okay, let's take it up a notch. <laughs> now, um, Whenever we talk about uh, white box testing, a lot of times we're thinking about things like control flow diagrams and, and those kinds of things. As I've taught this over the years, way before I ever started teaching certification courses, uh, I would al always include a decision table as one of the steps in this process. Now, you don't always have to do this, but let me tell you, if you go for the advanced technical test analyst certification, you're going to have to get really, really good at this, okay, because they get into the higher levels of coverage. So if, you've, if you're familiar at all with or have gone for the certification for foundation level, uh, ISTQB foundation level, you know that we only cover, address two levels of white box coverage, uh, statement level and decision outcome. Uh, coverage. We don't get into anything like condition coverage or multi-condition coverage or path coverage. However, those are discussed once again in the advanced technical test analyst uh, certification and it gets into some pretty deep water there. So I know this is a very uh, or a fairly, I'll say fairly complex uh, if statement here, but you'll see how we can greatly simplify it with using a decision table. So let's say that we have one of these wild and crazy if statements, and going back to my coding days, I can remember seeing this all the time, people writing conditions like this, and it's not bad practice, okay? It's just something that sometimes you'll have uh, decisions that are expressed in an if statement that can get a little bit complex. So uh, what we're saying here is if A is greater than B, so we just consider that basically as, uh, let me get a pin going here for just a second. So A greater than B is going to be one of my conditions or C less than D and A less than B now, this all kind of works together, okay? So it's either A greater than B or this and this being true, then we'll perform X. Otherwise, we perform Y. So the first thing we do is we're going to want to create a decision table for this. Now, I'm going to show you a little trick here that just makes this so easy. 
And when I when I first saw this, I thought that is really a slick, organized way to do this, because before I would kind of hash out as I could think of these. You know, I'd try certain combinations of first condition, second condition, third decision. Oh, and by the way, what you're seeing here in this fourth column, that's the outcome. OK, so you'll see here that A greater than B goes to column one. C less than D goes to column two. A less than B goes to column three. OK, so the slick thing is, OK, for A greater than B, I'm going to since I know that I have eight rows. And how do I know that? Because I have three conditions and I have two to the third power. So that tells me I'm going to have eight possible rows in this decision table. So the first four on the first column, A greater than B, will be true. The next four are going to be false. OK. Now, what I can do then is for the second column, C less than D, I'll make the first two true and the second two false. So that handles in this first in these first four all the situations all, all the combinations between uh, the first condition and the second condition being true and false for where a and b is true now for a and b is false we do the very same thing make the first two true and the second true false now this is where it gets kind of cool now for the third one, A less than B, then we do the first one true. And guess what the second one's going to be? That's right. It's going to be false. Third one's true. Next one's false. We just go alternating true, false, true, false, true, false. Now the outcome we base on what we're seeing in the if statement in this case. So the outcome for where A is greater than B and C is less than D and A is less than B, we're going to say we're going to perform X. Now, we're going to come back to that in just a second because there's a problem with that row. Where, uh, the outcome for the second condition uh, is also to perform X where A is true or the second part of the construct is true. The third one is also performing X. The fourth one is performing X. The fifth one also, now we get down to the sixth one, and now we're doing Y. The seventh one is Y, and the final one, the eighth one, is Y. Very critical part, uh, step in this process is now you have to eliminate your invalid or your duplicate cases. In this case, we eliminate the whole first row because A cannot be greater than B and less than B at the same time. And you'll see that. Right there. OK, we, we cannot have that uh, coexisting. Also, same thing right here. We have true and true there. Same kind of conflict. So what we do then is we hash those out. And now we create test cases. And so uh, the second row of our original decision table now becomes the first true test case that we can test. And we, we put actual values in here so that A is greater than B. OK, 6 is greater than 3. And then we also want C less than D, 2 less than 4. OK, and we want um, A less than B. So uh, being false, that, so that'd be 6 uh, and 3, that's false. And that would give us the expected result of performing X. Same thing for the uh, fourth row in the original table, which now becomes our second uh, uh, test case row. The only difference here is that now we have made C greater than D, okay, still performing X, and so forth. We keep the, the rest of them are just the basic translations with the numbers provided into the conditions. I'm not going to go through number by number on that. But if you download the slides later, uh, you'll be able to see that very clearly if you're having any confusion right now on it. Now, this would probably be a good time to check for any questions on that one. So I'm going to pop out of here for a minute and uh, just ask, are there any questions?
Okay. So, oh, uh, here's a, okay, a question. If, um, if A is greater than B, do you even have to look at C and D? Uh, yeah, you do, because um, it, it it's an or. I mean, I see what you're saying uh, with the or value. Uh, it, it kind of, how, how, how can I say this? If, uh, if A and B is true, then yes, you're going to be total, you're going to be performing X based on that value. The, the reason that you're still considering C and D is because those values are going to have to be supplied to the code to make that evaluation. Okay, but logically speaking, you're correct that it's that A greater than B uh, being true that's going to cause X to be performed. Um, but, you, but once again, the code cannot make that determination unless there's values in C and D. So that's why we have to, uh, to supply those uh, to, the, uh, to, to those variables. But that's a great question. Okay, now I... I um, I want to just address here for just a second the issue, the role of tools. You know, basically this is a manual process, um, the way it's often performed, that you have a test designer that will take in business rules, functional requirements, use cases, uh, any kind of specification basically. They may also be looking at processes um, and also even at the application itself. And as we've just seen, they may actually even want to consider the code as well. And from that, then create a decision table. Now, there is a tool that will support this. It's a really good tool, and I wish I had it when I'd been a tester uh, back, when, as I say, when I had a real job. Um, I still test stuff, but um, I not just not to the degree, degree 40 hours a, a week kind of thing. Uh, even though it's a manual effort, uh, uh, Richard Bender's a tool for requirements-based testing called Bender RBT uh, is not hugely expensive. I mean, it's not free or cheap, but at the same time, it doesn't cost as much as, let's say, a license for a capture playback tool does. And you have to write your requirements in a way that can be interpreted by the tool. But once you do that, then it does the cause-effect graphing for you. It creates the decision tables. And now he's even got functionality in there to create uh, orthogonal arrays and pairwise tests and things like that. So you get a lot of features with that tool. Now, I don't get paid anything, any commissions or anything like that. Uh, Dick's just been a, a friend of mine for a long, long time. And uh, I just think really highly of the tool and his whole approach to uh, requirements-based testing. Okay, here we go. Now, this is the, as I call it on the slide here, the infamous question number 24 from the ASTQB sample exam that's currently out on the ASTQB website. I go over this uh, whenever I teach a foundation level class uh, and we, we talk about, you know, how, how do we actually um, arrive at these conditions and everything. So here's the question. You've been given the following conditions and results from those condition combinations. Um, you can only have one form of payment. A PIN is only needed for a debit card. Given this information, using the decision table technique, what is the minimum number of test cases that you would need to test these conditions? Okay, so once again, the key here to answering this question is the minimum number of test cases. Now, they've done us a little bit of a favor uh, in that they have given us what the, the conditions are out here, as well as what the results can be. What I wish I had a little bit more information about was really what we're doing, <laughs> okay? So we're buying something, obviously, but are we buying it from a vending machine? Are we getting it from a uh, e-commerce website? Probably not since we're dealing with cash. Uh, are we walking up to someone at a a storefront, a counter, you know, like going into Walmart or someplace and, and giving them money. I, you really don't know, which 
could have a, an impact, let's say, on the valid cash. If you try to put invalid cash, you know, like maybe a Canadian quarter into a soda machine, it's going to reject it. But as we're going to see in looking at this uh, solution, uh, that's really uh, not what we need to be concerned with. Now, there are, oh, by the way, let me go back up here for just a second. There are uh, four possible answers given, 7, 13, 15, and 18. Uh, they're very crafty in how they did this because uh, they made one pretty low. And if you think about it for a second, you know that it can't be seven uh, simply because th there's too many combinations uh, that you can, you know that there's got to be more than seven combinations. You might think it's 13 or a couple more, 15 or maybe a few more, 18. You're going to have to hash this out to be able to answer this. So, um, let me pop over. The best way that I can show it to you uh, would be in Excel. So what I did here, and I, I kind of left it in pink and blue and tan so you could kind of see. What I did was just like I'm saying I uh, earlier, I did my happy path first. I, I did valid cash, made that true. Then that eliminates a credit card or debit card or PIN, right? Because we're dealing in cash. We're saying, okay, now here's where I, honestly, I had to really think for a few seconds on this. And by the way, let me emphasize, you only have about five minutes to answer this question on the exam. If you haven't gotten this thing in five minutes, you're going to have to move on because you don't have time to uh, to spend 15 minutes on a question like this. So anyway, uh, the bank accepting, I say, I don't know. So I'm, I'm going to make it I for right now because I'm thinking the bank's going to accept cash unless it's counterfeit or some kind of extreme condition, which I'm thinking that's not going to be part of this problem. And then we can go and we can focus on these uh, conditions, valid selection being true, item in stock is true, the selection may be valid but the item is not in stock, the, the selection may be invalid but there could be, still be items in stock, okay? All of that happening under valid cash as a, the form of payment. Now if we make the cash false, that it's not valid cash, then we don't care about any of the rest of them. Now, once again, I kind of have some confusion around this even myself because if it's invalid cash, you'd think, well, the, the bank would not accept it. I mean, that'd be a false maybe. But anyway, the right thing is if it's invalid cash, we don't care about any of these others that we've just filled in. So I'm pretty confident that I'm going to have four rules here, four columns for uh, the cash. Now, I go to the next set. It's not cash, so let's say credit card. So I just go go down to the next line. And happy path, once again, valid credit card. I don't care about debit, don't care about PIN. I say the bank accepts our credit card. We have make, make a valid selection, and the item is in stock. Okay, we're looking good. Second row, uh, you'll notice what I've done here is I've just toggled the true to false. And then the next row down, true to false. And then the next row down, true to false. And based on what I'm seeing up above here, too, uh, basically what I'm doing with these four conditions is I'm trying to come out with all the true-false conditions where the credit card is true, okay? And um, I, if I have a false up here, which is what the third, I'm sorry, which is what the fifth uh, column of the credit card conditions would be, then I don't care about valid selections or items in stock. So these five give me all the variations of bank accepting, valid selection, and item in stock if it's the credit card uh, that we're dealing with. Okay, so we're two-thirds of the way done. And it's only been just three or four minutes here. So now we go down to valid debit card, and I'm going to say, okay, all of these are true. Valid debit card, valid PIN, the bank accepted it, valid selection, item in stock, and 
my that outcome down here is true. Now, you, you may be wondering, well, Randy, why don't you have outcomes down here? Very simple. I don't need outcomes. All I need are tests, uh, the, the number of columns to uh, create test cases from. Uh, I don't have time answering the questions to worry about figuring out the outcomes. Uh, they, they don't affect the number of columns. Now, in real life, applying the technique absolutely would have to do that. But for answering the question, I'm just leaving these blank. As you can see, I attempted to start doing them here, and it just got too, too it's just taking too much time. Okay. Now, and of course, keep in mind on an exam, you're doing this on pencil and paper as well. So uh, the valid debit card, let's say, is true. Let's say the invalid pin uh, it, it, the, or the pin is invalid. Uh, therefore, uh, the bank does not accept. Therefore, we don't care about the, uh, the next two conditions. Uh, we could have everything good. Valid debit card, valid pin, bank accepts. Then we get into the world of the valid selections and the items being in stock, going from true, false. If it's in stock, we don't care. I'm sorry, if it's invalid selection, we don't care about it being in stock in this case. And then finally, I'm sorry, next to finally, we have also the, the consideration of a um, valid debit card, invalid pin, the bank not accepting. So we have a false I and false, and therefore we don't care about the selections and being in stock. And then there's one more that we have to pick up here that I failed to forget. Now, keep in mind, this is kind of the raw version of me just going through this. Is the valid pin, uh, the bank accepting, but an invalid selection? Um, we don't have those three conditions represented anywhere thus far. Okay. Now, I'll show you what the uh, answer is that... Uh, they arrive that, that they show on the um, answers, and you'll see it's very close to what I came up with, uh, except they don't show the eyes, and they do show the outcomes. But one thing I want to call to your attention, and uh, so the answer is 15, and we only know that because we are considering the invalids and the illogicals. But notice there's a pattern here too, that look at the ends. You don't see it. Sorry about that. You don't see it so much on um, in, in this one, but you, you start to see it here where the ends start to cascade downward like that. You also see it here where the nose cascade down. And then they made their 15th case uh, the unhappy path of the no. Okay. And that's how they wound up with that answer of, 15. Okay. Now uh, I'm going to take a break out of this one. I go back over to uh, the chat menu. I, uh, see Catherine is asking, um, is this assuming that you do not, uh, that you do not need to have a pin for a credit card? Ah, great point. Uh, that's a requirement here in Canada. Well, uh, Kath Catherine, um, they don't really give that as part of the rule. So um, that was kind of the same situation I found myself in questioning what kind of purchase is this anyway. Now, of course, your question is more global. Uh, here in the U.S., they don't require a PIN yet for a credit card, only for debit. So that's probably why it was worded the way it is for the uh, American exam. But um, that would make this table larger, wouldn't it? If you had to deal with the uh, uh, with the pen requirement for a, a credit card, uh, Irina asked the question. So in the exam, uh, do we uh, we need to look for the cascade? Well, you won't have the cascade uh, effect. Uh, you you have to you can use that though as a benefit in your design. Now, see in my in my case, uh, I didn't really do it that way. I didn't do the falses where they. Um, well, I guess maybe in a way I did. There's a false, there's a false, there's a false. Um, in a way, I kind of hashed it out like that. Um, but it keeps it from being quite less or a little bit less random in nature and lets you determine it. So uh, if you kind of, in a, I guess in a way, you're working your way up almost from the bottom. But uh, another way to say it is you, you do 
trues as much as you can then the when the when the first when you encounter the first false then typically those below it will probably be invalid uh, not all the time is that true but anyway i can't say that you take that as a um as a firm rule but i i think it is interesting that they they did show it that way it's a very very organized way to see it um oh you're welcome catherine uh, Ricky asks, could you go back to the original condition screen, please? Yes, absolutely. Is this the one that you're wanting to see, Ricky? Okay. Uh, so let me uh, go ahead and put this in full view. So what they did here was on, on, on the sample question, they, they help, it helps a lot that they did this, by the way. Otherwise, it would take another probably five minutes or so to identify all the conditions, and you would have to have them 100% correct before you could answer the question correctly. So when I do this as an exercise in the classes that I teach, we actually that I have the students actually define the conditions from the problem, just in case. But in the sample exam, we'll see that they, they give it to you. And um, yeah, had they not given us this, um, I don't know, you can kind of look up here to the top and see uh, th there's nothing, for example, in this description about valid selections or um, in, or an item in stock. There's nothing in there about that. Um, there's also nothing about the bank accepting or not. So it would be virtually as to know that these three conditions existed had they not give us, given us these conditions. Now, kind of sneaky here on the results to show, you know, what's the outcome. Um, once again, if you spend your time dealing with the results, then you're going to take a lot of time away from answering other questions. So, of course, the decision table, they have to have the results here. But, you know, it could have been just as simple as um, sell item, not sell item, or something like that. But anyway, that, that's just my opinion. <laughs> that doesn't really matter uh, for, that, for that much. Um, and, uh, oh, okay. Um, yeah, um, Kim asked the question. I thought it said in the question that only a debit card needs a pin. That is true um, in, the, um, in, in the specification there that they, they said. Um, so yes, uh, Irina, the, the answer there is C, is 15, um, uh, 15 columns or 15 rules that you come up with. Now, once again, my advice on this, and this is just my advice, you can do it however you want to. But my advice is when you see a question at this level of complexity, then you would probably, um, if you wind up spending more than about five to seven minutes on it, you need to go on and then come back to it uh, if you have time. Chances are you'll have time to come back to it. Um, there's also the same rule applies for uh, uh, interpreting some of the more pseudocode based example and that kind of thing. Um, Okay. Oh, Irina asked a follow-up question. What is the formula again to calculate the number of cases? It's two to the nth power. However, that's for the complete number of all possible conditions. Okay. So that's a very important thing to consider. And it does not consider that some of these will be invalid. Like, um, let's just look at the first one, the, the valid cash item, uh, valid selection item stock. You could have eight possible initial r rules just for those three conditions, okay? So it would be whatever two to the seventh power is. I don't, uh, what would you, I think we said earlier that was 256. Um, if I ask a question about if you have uh, six or seven conditions and you want to test all possible conditions, uh, combinations, how many test cases would you have, then that's how you'd figure it. It would be 2 to the 7th power, where 7 is the number, or 2 to the nth power, where n is the number of conditions, I'm sorry. And, um, but they tend to, in my 
observation, like to ask questions more about minimum number of things and maximum number of things. Yeah, right. Two to the third power is eight, and that would, but that would only consider the first eight columns. Then you have the, the next grouping, and then you have the next grouping, and these are all multiplied by each other too, okay? So it would be a two to the seventh power in this case where you have seven conditions here that you're dealing with uh, for the total possible number of columns that you could come up with uh, without hashing it out with the invalids uh, being accounted for. Okay, so um, we're getting close to our ending time. Let me just kind of close out. I, I hope that answers everyone's questions. If it doesn't, uh, feel free to contact me by email. I'll be happy to um, to answer any questions, or it might maybe just a matter you might want to just replay the uh, session again once we have access to that. But uh, kind of want to close out with a couple of important points here that. Uh, just keep in mind that the value of decision table testing is it allows you to uh, extend your view of testing to things that maybe you haven't thought of yet. And whenever logical decisions are involved is really where it shines. Uh, a couple of good references. I know these are very old books, okay? But in my opinion, some of the oldest books are some of the best books out there. The Art of Software Testing, I mentioned cause-effect graphing earlier. Well, he... He, this is probably the best book on that topic, written in 1978. I think everyone said Glenn Myers did it best, and no one else decided they needed to write on it. But he ties that with decision tables. The second book, uh, Boris Beiser's Software Testing Techniques, second edition. If you're going to get this book, make sure you get the second edition. Um, he goes into this topic in extreme detail and does it very well. This is a, actually kind of a technical book. If someone's going for the advanced technical test analyst, I highly recommend this book to you. Um, and the great thing about these old books are you can go to these used bookstore websites like ABE Books or uh, Alibris.com. And even now, Amazon is picking up from the used inventories of these bookstores. And like I just recently bought uh, The Art of Software Testing for $4 with free shipping, you know. Uh, software testing techniques, I think I paid uh, maybe $5 and got free shipping. I often buy these books and give them away at conferences because they're, they're just so good. And this was the book that got me into software testing, actually, software testing techniques by Boris Beiser. Now, I, I think we probably handled uh, most of the questions out there. Um, if not, uh, we're right at our time limit. I don't want to keep you any longer. I do want to say thank you very much uh, for being here. Um, there's uh, my scary picture in my bio. And um, here's my contact information, email address, if you want to uh, send me an email and uh, you know ask me questions or anything like that. By the way, um, I don't know how many people we have left in here. Let me, let me check real fast. Um, the... Um, uh, I am always uh, open and I, I welcome to hear your topics, you know, that you're interested in, um, that you might want to have a, uh, a webinar about. I, I picked this one because I've taught a few classes recently and it seemed to be an area that people kind of struggled with. So I thought it was deserving of a webinar. But if you have a particular topic, like I had um, a, a friend suggest uh, accessibility testing for disabilities and, and things like that, for ADA testing and stuff. Um, and I thought, yeah, that would be a pretty good one, a very um, overlooked form of testing. But if you have any suggestions, uh, let me know. Uh, go out and visit my Facebook page if you like. Uh, just look for Randy Rice's software testing page out on Facebook and you'll find it. Uh, you can also come to my website, riceconsulting.com, contact me from there. Uh, you can reach me in any number of ways on this. But I hope today has been helpful to you. I I hope that um, it's been a time that uh, maybe pulling a few concepts together, you know, which can be uh, kind of helpful when you're in test design. It's um, uh, kind of a, a very nuanced thing that we're dealing with here. And um, so a lot of little things around the edges sometimes that we need to consider and sometimes we miss when we do test design. So um, at that, I'm going to uh, say if no one else has any questions. Oh, thank you, Ricky. 
uh, for your compliment there. Very informative. I appreciate that. Um, and for all of you who took an hour out of your Thursday and maybe out of your lunchtime, I really appreciate you being here. And I'll try to do this again next month on a topic uh, that seems to resonate with people. And uh, you're the group that comes to these webinars, so feel free to give me your suggestions, and I'll be happy to uh, see what I can do about addressing those. Okay? All right. Well, hey, everyone, have a great day. We'll talk to you later. Thanks for being here.